Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, June 11th, 2015. This is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week, I swear, I really mean it. We've got a lot to cover, so I'm going to get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Make it some Mountain Dew to not compensate me for this free endorsement. But hey, PepsiCo, you out there, let me know. Red Bull said it was too fat, as many of you may know, uh, that I'm too fat and that Red Bull said I was too fat. And also, um, who else was it? It was Monster. Uh, we were short Monster, so I don't think they like us very much at one point in time. Anyway, enough of that nonsense. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you could lose money trading or just let me sum it up really quick. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Okay? Yeah, a couple of people say, oh, not just one person says no sound. Uh, turn your speakers up. Well, I guess you can't hear me. <laughs> turn your speakers up. <laughs> I'm showing uh, sound here. Uh, sometimes a squirrel will, will be moving his nuts and get them caught uh, in the wires between uh, me and you. So uh, the good news is the recording is very robust. That We have never, knock on wood, have problems with that. All right, what we talk about? Well, Good. Thank you, Rich. Sound is good. I woke up about 4 a.m. and started writing today's seminar in my head. And I, I kind of went to bed thinking about it, so that's probably why I woke up uh, thinking about it. And I want to talk about trading psychology today and the importance of it. And really, that's the main thing. The, the methodology is fairly straightforward. Now, it doesn't mean that it didn't a lot of work. You don't have to work at it. And stock selection, that was kind of the missing piece. After I wrote the books, I realized maybe that's the missing piece because I see the setups, and I know it's a good setup. But it takes a little experience, and I can teach you that experience. And that's why we spent 14 hours in the course just on stock selection. That's going to come up in a minute or two. But it's very learnable. And the money management is almost mechanical. Now, there's some discretion that comes with a little bit of experience that can be done with all of this. But for the most part, I don't want to say it's all mechanicals, but they are mechanical. But it is mechanics, a lot of this stuff, okay? So, but... I was thinking about how you are the only thing that stands between you and success. And I want to give you a, cra a, tra a crash course, easy for me to say, in trader psychology. Seminar sounds like I'm in the church of Dave. Is it echoing or something? Microphone. Oh, no, it should be fine. And I, I kind of had a bit of an epiphany, and I'm, and I'm not going to tell you. Instead of just telling you about it, I'll, we'll just jump into it, tell you what we're going to talk about. But anyway, we'll get to that in just one second. Anything you want me to cover, start thinking now. We've got a lot to cover today, but uh, we'll, we'll see if we can squeeze it in. Uh, hang off on your individual stock picks until we get to the actual live charts, just so we can, uh, it doesn't get mixed in with the other questions. And my only, my only request there is just ask about one stock at a time. You can ask about 15 stocks or 20 stocks or 30 stocks. Just ask about one, hit uh, enter, and then ask about another one. That way I can delete it after I cover it and we won't get too confused. Okay, now, I got the idea that I, I really want to do a course on trading psychology. And I started collecting some notes on it. And those notes have grown and grown and grown. And it's getting bigger and bigger by the day. And, but like I said, I woke up this morning thinking that I could really boil this down in what has to be done in less than an hour. And if you stay with me, you'll be glad you stayed with me for this hour, I, I think, at least. And it's simple. It's kind of like my ultimate guide to determining market trends. And I actually do have a book that I wrote. It's a little pamphlet type of book, and I joke about it being a book. I've got about a thousand of them here. I had them printed in China, and I never did get around to getting a, um, a mailer for those or anything. But um, if you want a copy, let me know. I'll figure out a way to get it to you. And it's just a book that has three pages in it, and, and the pages are uptrend, downtrend, and sideways, and then the end, and of course, a little bit about me in the end, and a disclaimer up front saying that you can't lose money trading. 
So trading psychology is really kind of simple when you boil it all down. It, it To understand it is one thing. To practice it properly and avoid getting too caught up in your own emotions is a little bit more difficult. It's kind of like my soon-to-be-written ultimate weight loss system, which is guaranteed. And that's simply just eat less and move more. And that's all you have to do, lose weight. I mean, I guess it's, you could have some sort of physical problem that would prevent you from doing that. But I, even, even still, um, I think if you ate less and moved more, you would um, – you would lose weight. I had to, unfortunate, uh, my wife was watching that 600 pound life show <laughs> and I had an unfortunate, uh, uh, few minutes of seeing part of that, <clears throat> excuse me. And, uh, trust me, that's something you can't unsee, but even her, you know, she started moving before her surgery and I think she dropped like 60 pounds and all she did was like move her arms and eat a little bit less candy. So it can be done. Well, Dave, are you fat? Well, because I don't, because I need to eat less and move more, but I'm working on it. And Dave, you've been working on that for years. Hey, shut up. Leave me alone. All right. So fixing you may take a little bit longer than a couple of days. And and I was kind of thinking, like, I, I do this psychology course. And it would kind of be like the IPO course, probably about four hours, and then maybe some follow-up sessions. But the more I think about it, this thing is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's weird. It's like I had this epiphany. It's like all you have to do is this. You know, it's kind of like eat less and move more. But to actually do those things, obviously, there's a lot more that has to happen. You know, it's like a with the dieting, it's a lifestyle change. You have to change the way you're doing things, the habits and all. And I don't want to get into that because I'm obviously not an expert because I'm still fat. But when it comes to psychology, if you boil it all down, it's really pretty simple. But being able to do that is complex. And I've seen people that have gone 20 years and they're still not successful. We're going to talk about that in just one second. So I think it's going to take me about two days to do this when I do about after it's all written. But. One or two days of your life is a lot better than another 20 years of being unsuccessful. And it's hard to believe that somebody would go 20 years and not be successful, but I see it all the time. And then recently, it's like I've been having these epiphanies, and, and I don't know if it was turning 50 or some other things that happened in my life. Uh, more recently, I did take some uh, steps to improve my health, and I don't know if it's a combination of those thereof or what, but... It's like I could see things more clearly now, and there's some other reasons for that too. But I've reached a point where I started cutting off people, and I've cut off some people after 10 years, after 15 years, after 20 years, because if you're not willing to fix yourself, then why are you wasting my time? Now, that sounds a little harsh. But that's probably the best thing I could do for them, provided, of course, they don't go run off and, and chase somebody else and think that they're going to have they have the Holy Grail. But I'm hoping that it's a bit of a wake up call for these people, because why would you email me after five years of not doing the right thing? OK, not that if you buy something from me, that's going to be the be all end all. And that's going to fix all your problems. But first of all, if you did. And if you followed it and you still were unsuccessful, then maybe I have a problem. But I know it works, and I know that it does take a little time. But if you go that long and you're still unsuccessful, maybe it's you. So in this course, I started making a list of things. And some of the things are like why we do what we do. And don't worry, the course is not available. It won't be available. I don't know. It might take me six months. It might take me a year to write this thing. But I got to thinking about like, why we do what we do. And one important thing is that why we are not really wired to trade. The trading world is much different than the real world, okay, that we live in. And it's very hard to make that transition. And it does take a while, okay, but it doesn't take 20 years. 
And then, as I've said quite before, uh, a lot before, we, I wrote a lot about this at Labor's, and we talk about it quite often. We talk, we talk about the three-stranded rope, which I talk about so much, I left it out of this presentation. It just wasn't time to get there in this forum. But as you see me talk about it before, there's three strands. There's psychology, there's money management, and there's a methodology. And all of these three are interwoven and intertwined, however you want to look at that analogy. But if you get good at just one of these things, the other two fall in place. If your stock selection gets better, then your ability to follow your plan and your trading psychology gets much better. And then following that plan, your money management gets much better. And then the strands get stronger and stronger and stronger. And you become better and better at what you do. So those three are integrated. I'll talk about that quite a bit. And you have to understand behavior of others. And that's all that technical analysis is about. And I think I'll probably end up going off on a big tangent on that and talk about the psychology of technical analysis. And just think about little things like if there is overhead supply. If you're looking at a market and it looks, it's doing this, okay? And then it drops. And then you got the mother of all setups right here. But there's a big mound of overhead supply above the market. Well, these people are going to be inclined to get out of break even. And as I'm studying some behavioral finance now and brushing up on all my trading psychology books, uh, including my own writings in trading psychology and my own seminars, webinars, whatever, in trading psychology, it's making me realize that on the surface, yeah, people just look at out, looking to get out at break even. But there's, there's a little bit more deeper reasoning behind that. Now, whether or not you need to know this reasoning or just take it at face value, uh, that remains to be seen. But I think it, it helps to understand what's going on under the surface. And there's a pain involved with the loss. And that pain is, is greater than the excitement of a gain. So the pain of a loss is a much stronger emotion than the the thrill or the excitement of a game. So people will hold on to that losing trade and they want to get they want to get out at break even. It becomes like a like a um what's a good word? Vengeance maybe or something for them. Revenge or, or something. And so they hang on because that's a strong emotion and they want to be vindicated. They want to but they're not going to hang on and let it go through where they bought for the most part. They're going to get out at break even because they want to stop the pain. And they want to just say, okay, let's, let's just be done with this, with this trade. Okay. So if you get into a market and there's overhead supply, there's a good chance that they're going to dump that position on top of you. Okay. So your gains are going to be very limited. So this is the psychology of others. And the psychology of others can be read through technical analysis. And that's the only way you can read the psychology of others. And guess what? You don't know exactly what they're going to do. I don't know what I'm having for lunch today, okay? I have a good idea what I would like to have, but uh, I might change my mind between now and then, okay? So these people might change their mind between now and then, too. So you have no control over what they will do, okay? So, again, it's understanding the behavior of others is vitally important, but what's even more important is understanding yourself. And then as I was looking through my list this morning, I've got about 10 pages so far, it's like you have to come to grips with the psychology of possessions, if I own something, I put more value into it than it's probably really worth, okay? I've dumped a bunch of money into an old car I'm restoring, and I thought it would take me about six months, and now I'm about six years in. And if you ask my wife, she'll correct me and say it's probably like eight years in, okay? It's taken me a long time. And I know what I've done. It'll be worth a certain amount in reality. But to me, it's going to be worth a lot more. And that's been proven that anytime you, you have a possession, you think it's worth more than what it should be. So anytime you buy a stock, you think that that stock should be worth more than what it should be or what it is. Okay. 
But if you don't own a stock, you don't have that. You don't look at a stock and say that stock should be higher. Okay. Now, if you've got the right setups and you're doing your homework, then all of a sudden you might get excited and say, yeah, but that's a different thing. But I'm just saying as a general statement, if you own a stock versus not owning a stock, you're going to feel like that stock should be higher. And obviously there's a lot of ups and downs in trading accountability. If there's no accountability for your actions, you're going to keep doing the wrong thing. If your motives are wrong or if you're not, if you're, you've got a gambling instinct about you or uh, if, if you have an ego about you, which we all do, okay, and you're trying to outsmart the market and you're not accountable to anyone, okay? I, had a, I have a doctor friend. I have more than one doctor friend that I'm, I'm talking about. So certain people that are listening right now, I think I'm going to be talking about them. And it might be a part of what you do, but there's quite a few, few of you like this. And some wealthy other individuals too, for that matter. I like to pick on doctors. I don't like to pick on doctors, but doctors seem to make the worst traders. And we could get into that in just one second. In fact, highly successful people make the worst traders. And I'm going to elaborate on that in just one second. But if you're making a lot of money and you're very successful, and I know people that have, in addition to their, their main career, they've taken some money and they started a real estate career. And in addition to that career, they started another business and they're making money in that business. So they're, they're literally making millions a year. And they have a trading account with, let's say, 25000 in it. And they blow it up. And they get all bummed out and stressed out. And they write me an email or call me. And, you know, I console them a little bit. And, and guess what? They put another 25000 in. They blow it up again. Okay. Kind of a rinse and repeat cycle. Now, it might take six months. might take a few years. But it's the same cycle that happens over and over. And the reason being is they try to outsmart the market. They try to apply their success from their prior or current career and, and project that into the markets. And the market doesn't care about all that. The market doesn't care about their ego and everything else. And they have no control. But if there was an accountability for these people, okay, even though it's only, I know only doesn't sound like a lot, but if you're a, an entrepreneur and you're making millions of dollars a year, 25000 is still a lot of money, but in the general schemes of things, it's not a tremendous amount of money. But I'd be willing to bet they went home and told their wife, hey, I just um, I started this trading thing. I don't have any plan. I'm not following any plan. I'm jumping from methodology to methodology, and I lost $25,000. And... Uh, by the way, I lost $25,000 last year doing that, and uh, I think I'm going to put $50,000 in my account uh, this year and do that. Oh, I lost at $50,000. Now, I'd be willing to bet their wife or significant other or spouse, whatever the case may be, or, or, or if it's a – it seems they have more trouble with, with – I've, I've met a few women that had some really bad problems, but I have to tell you, and, and who was the hedge fund guy that said women can't trade? That's bullshit because – I know more successful women on a percentage basis than I do successful men when it comes to the markets because women can put their ego aside. This hedge fund guy got himself in a lot of trouble because he said that that women are too emotional for trading. But I think that when it comes to failure, ego trumps emotion. Okay. So if their wives, so let's pick on the, pick on the men here. If their wives were seeing them piss away this money, pardon my French, then I think things would change quickly. Now, I don't want to get too far into any one of these things. I just wanted to kind of list them here. But as I'm saying them, as usual, <laughs> a rant comes up. Uh, accountability is very important. Ghost of trades past. You have a crappy trade, a crappy trade, a crappy trade. Let's say three in a row. You have the mother of all setups. What do you do? Well, you don't take it because you just had three crappy trades, right? No, you have to take it. That trade might make up for those prior three crappy trades and your entire year. But every time we have this loss in a trade, it's not that independent event. 
it is the loss of every other bad trade that we ever had. It's kind of like with kids, okay, or your spouse. <laughs> you know, kid, let's pick on kids for a minute. When that kid does something that, that aggravates you, when that teenager smarts off to you, it's not necessarily that one isolated event. It's like every other time they ever smarted off to you. It's kind of like, oh, here we go again. You know, and it's hard in trading and in life a lot of times just to view that one event as an isolating event. And you have to learn how to embrace and not eliminate your emotions. Losing the win. We're going to talk about that in just a second. So I don't want to get too far into that. Capitalizing on the emotions of others while controlling your own. Very important. That's what we just talked about with, or what I just talked about, I guess, with the psychology of technical analysis and everything I do from a technical analysis standpoint is a psychological basis go in and watch last week's webinar on trend knockouts what's a trend knockout well it's a sharp move lower in a stock at a sharp ideally persistent uptrend that knocks people out and those people are going to be pissed off they might want to get back in and that's going to help push a stock higher it's also going to attract some shorts into that stock because their egos are thinking, hey, this stock is toast. They have no meaningful fundamentals. Look at this stupid IPO biotech. They lost $3 a share last year. They're going to be out of business in no time. I'm going to short this stock. And what happens? Well, it goes up. And they're forced to cover at a higher price. So you need to learn how to capitalize on the psychology of others while controlling your own. Phraseology is vitally important. If you come in and the market's against you, what do you say? You drop an F-bomb or do you say, oh, that's interesting. And there's a lot of games you can play when it comes to phraseology. Um, you need to learn how to sing like you don't need the money. And that's kind of hard. You have to kind of separate yourself from the money, at least as long as you're in the trade. And then there's a few hundred more things that you're going to have to conquer. And as I said earlier, another thing is why successful people like you are the most attracted to trading, by, but ironically, you are the most ill-suited for trading, okay? And then, like I said, I've got about 10 pages of things. But we could boil it all down to something really simple. So provided I get this course together, which I will, or I should say when I get it together, I would love for you to come. I think it would be a great course. And I, I think it's going to be my masterpiece, and that's why I don't want to be under any pressure to get it done. I want it to, it's just like that, it's this this last book I'm working on. I've been working on it for two years. You know, it's like I'm not in a hurry to get it out. I don't want to get it out for the sake of having some product. I don't care about that. And that's why I want to, to get something out. But in the meantime, I think I could boil it down for you. And if you could take steps and understand what I'm going to say today, yeah, there's some more details you probably should know. Okay. But I think if I boil it down, I think you could be well on your way. So I think if you understand this, again, you're going to be well on your way. And this was kind of the epiphany that I had last night and this morning. Like life, every trade has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Now think about that. You do your analysis. You find a trade. You enter that trade. And then at some point it's going to end. And that's every trade. So trade is the key word in that sentence. It is an action, and every action has a beginning, a middle, and the end. Okay, Dave, that's enough. All right, well, let's take a look at this. Let's talk about the beginning. Everything is known. Before you get into the stock, and once I show you the chart, it's gonna make a lot more sense. But you know 
everything by looking at a picture of the chart that has happened in the entire history of that stock. You could see where there was some buying, where there's some selling, some buying and selling, maybe just some chop, some trends, some acceleration in trends, some deceleration in trends, some overhead supply, some wide range bars, some narrow range bars, expansion in volatility, compression in volatility. Everything is known historically. Okay, so before you get into that trade, you have a lot of information to process, but you could do it in a relaxing manner. I get a big cup of coffee. People in my service, you know, I always joke about halfway through my service. I'm like, and then I say, oh, sorry, guys, uh, one cup of coffee tomorrow, Dave, one cup of coffee tomorrow. But I get that jazzed up. I probably don't need that cup of coffee. I'm just in the habit of, of drinking it, and I, I just like drinking coffee, okay? So it's a relaxing thing for me before I get into the trade. Once I get in, ah, not so much, okay? I'm human too. Just because I decided to trade doesn't mean I don't still have a pulse, okay? But you have to do that obsession before you get into a trade and not afterwards. Is it really a great setup? I think that bears repeating. Is it really a great setup? Could you find something even better? Always ask yourself, okay? Deliberate practice. I'm a big fan of studying the mind and understanding how things work, studying success, Malcolm Gladwell kind of stuff. Read everything he's ever written, by the way. Uh, you can get a lot of his books uh, listed on my website. But uh, Outliers, I think, was one of his better books where he talked about how you become um, – how talent is made and not born. And I, I recently – I said not to read it only because someone said that it's, it's, it's just kind of a – Repeat it somewhere else. But I went ahead and bought the book anyway. Talent is – it's called Talent is Overrated. I haven't read it yet, but I think it's important. Uh, it's probably it, – if it backs up even just in a small way, this other thing about how talent is made, not born. Okay? Uh, I don't want to digress too far. I imagine that. But my daughter, when she was about six years old, she had a, uh, a tooth pulled or something, and she was in a lot of pain. She's pretty bummed out about it. So I took her to Walmart, and, you know, she was looking at some little toys and stuff, and I was going to let her pick out a toy. She was kind of halfway interested in something, but she was in so much pain, she really wasn't that excited. So I let her kind of look around a little bit, and then I kind of steered her into a little guitar, okay? Knowing that the guitar would be something a little bit better than some little toy that's going to last a few months, even though it was more expensive, I thought, hey, maybe, maybe we're on to something here. Maybe if I can get her interested in this, this would be a good thing. Well, she couldn't believe that she could actually get the guitar because she knew she could tell it was more expensive. She wasn't even looking at it. And guess what? She started learning how to play it, and she started practicing. And when she was just, uh, I forget what grade, maybe like sixth grade or something, she did, she did Jimi Hendrix Star Spangled Banner, and she nailed it. And then she threw a little Yankee Doodle Dandy in the middle of it, and it was – Pretty impressive. There's a video out there somewhere on that. I don't have to put it on YouTube, I guess. So the point is that she got better at it, okay? And how did she get better at it? Well, you get better at anything through deliberate practice. And now she sings and performs. Uh, her singing was horrible. But every day, you know, I remember one time I was outside. She was singing in the shower. And it's a good thing she didn't watch these shows. <laughs> And I literally ran in the house. I thought something was wrong. It sounded like it sounded like somebody was killing a, a, a an animal. <laughs> but now she sings really well, and she actually uh, she's done some open mics. She does uh, performances in front of about 500 people, uh, and she does it quite often. Well, how did she get better? Well, through deliberate practice. Talent is made. Talent is not born. Okay, none of us are born to trade. We have to work at it. But deliberate practice, working to get better. Don't just look at those charts. Look at those charts with the intention of getting better at looking at those charts. And the more you look at them, the better you're going to get. If you see a stock take off, ask yourself, was that a pattern that I recognize? Is it a new pattern? How could I have caught this before? And sometimes things just go up and you have to pass. No big deal. You're not going to kiss all the web and you're not going to catch every move. No methodology is a be all end all. Not even Big Dave's methodology. But look at the charts with the intention on getting better. Okay? 
So this is what you do before you get into any setup. And then really ask yourself, could I have found something better? Did I look at all of its tradable brethren? Are there any sexy sisters or brothers, depending on your way you want to look at that, that look better than your setup? Well, go dig through the entire sector and see if there's anything that looks even better it, or your tradable universe within that sector, the more liquid stocks, obviously, or liquid enough to trade, I should say. And then honestly ask yourself, did I really dig through and exhaust all possibilities in my database? Sometimes you just see a setup, and this is going to happen in time, and this has happened to every now and then. It doesn't happen every day with me, but every now and then I'll see a setup, and I'll just know with almost 100% certainty that this stock is going to make a lot of money. And my clients are like, well, Dave, why don't you tell us that ahead of time? It's like, I can't because as soon as I do, you can put all your money in it, and I'm going to be wrong. And I know I still could be wrong on any trade. But I guarantee you, as you get better and better at this, there are just stocks. You're going to go through your charts, and you're going to get that. Oh, it's like you have to catch your breath feeling. And, and, and if you don't look at charts and feel that way, then maybe you should do something else for a living, okay? Or if you still want to trade, I'll be happy to do it for you. But you should get this excitement to where you got to catch your breath when something looks that good, okay? And that doesn't happen every day, but then if it does, then you know you really have something. Now, if the market is iffy, I mean, we've been chopping sideways for months. How I found stocks that trended, I have no idea, okay? Well, maybe I do have an idea because I dug and dug and dug and dug through the database until I could find something. And sometimes I don't find anything, and sometimes I don't do anything. I had people quit my service last September because it was not enough action for them. Well, if they're looking for action, they should go to Vegas, right? And what happened afterwards? Of course, well, the market kept trending along, but what happened? We found stocks that trended. We found stocks that worked. That doesn't always happen that way. That I can promise you. And then sometimes you won't have something to do you'll have to sit on your hands and do nothing and like tom petty said the waiting is the hardest part but if the market is iffy okay right now this stupid market's been chopping sideways forever so make sure you really 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 like a setup i'm under a little pressure to produce product and i resist that pressure okay now i use that pressure to my advantage don't get me wrong i use it to my advantage and dig through a lot of stocks but as i've said before Way back in the in the days where where um, I was with the prior website, and they had salesmen that were selling uh, a service for me. If I would not recommend stocks because I wasn't personally taking action, salesmen would call me up and say we're losing clients. If I recommended some crappy stocks, we might lose a few clients, but nowhere near the amount of clients we would lose if I wasn't putting out product, so to speak. So there was some pressure to put out a product, and then I had to weigh that moral decision and say, you know what, if I'm not doing anything, then you shouldn't do anything. So there are times when you shouldn't do anything. But when the market is iffy, and I know almost all the time the market is iffy, right? But like right now, we're just chopping around, chopping around, chopping around, chopping around. So make sure you really, really like a setup. Now, if it's an emerging trend, just a couple things real quick. Emerging trend like a new trend emerging, a transitional type of setup. Is it off a major, major low? You have like a well-defined bow tie or is it, is it kind of sloppy? Okay, or or and is there ser some sort of serious thrust higher from the lows? All these things I talk about when I talk about bow ties and all these other transitional type of patterns. Are there any bad memories? Again, there's that uh, overhead resistance reared its ugly head or overhead supply. Okay. Now, if it's a if it's a stock in an, an existing trend, you need to ask yourself: Does the stock persist? Is the trend accelerating? Does the stock trade cleanly, or does it look like electrocardiogram? I get emails all the time from people with stocks that are just bouncing all over the place. Hey, Dave, think about buying this stock. Why? <laughs> did you did you not read the ultimate guide to determining stock market trends that says uptrend? downtrend and sideways so make sure it persists make sure it accelerates make sure it trades cleanly and then everything else I covered in the remaining 13 hours and 55 minutes of the stock selection course okay and again when you're looking at a stock we're all successful here I mean seriously would you really be taking time out 
of your busy schedule to try to get better as a trader, as a person, if you weren't motivated, successful to begin with in your current or prior career. So I know everybody here is looking to become better, I mean, and not lazy. The problem is, in trading, sometimes you don't have to do anything or you shouldn't do anything. The best action is no action. But that's hard for many. It's hard for successful people. Your doctors are seeing patients all day long. Your builders are building something. You automatic transmission mechanics or repairing some transmissions. You're not going to get paid to sit on your butt. Now, in trading, you might not get paid to sit on your butt, but you're going to lose buddy if you take action when no action needs to be taken. So it can be kind of tough sometimes. And that's where that intuition versus intuition comes into play. And this is going to get better and better and better and better and better. This is going to be intuition versus this. The more you exercise that deliberate practice. And at the beginning too, you need to think about, are you trying to be smart? Are you trying to look smart, be smart, or beat the system? I get emails all the time. Hey, Dave, I'm long XYZ. XYZ? I don't remember that stock. Yeah, yeah, you recommended it about uh, two months ago. Oh, let me let me pull the chart. I don't remember that. So I pulled the chart, and what happens with XYZ? It's like, oh, okay, yeah, I see it now. And it, it XYZ looks like this, and it has a beautiful little setup, and it's accelerating, and everything looks wonderful. But XYZ does this. I had an entry up here. Maybe we moved it down a little bit, and then on this day here, well, let's just give up, okay, because it's not going to work. Let's go find something else. This one's obviously not working. That's fine, okay? And so three months from now, I got an email. Dave, what should you do with XYZ? Well, why did you even enter it? Well, you said to enter at 12, and I thought at 10 it was cheaper. No. <laughs> it's like uh, be like the uh, Beatrice, you know? It's like that's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. The reason we wait for an entry is to make sure that the stock is trending, to make sure it's uh, it, or at least resuming that trend at least for the time we're getting in. Make sure it's moving back in our favor. No ticking, no trading, okay? So I see that a lot of times, people trying to look smart to make money. So all these things happen in the beginning. Now, let's let's take a look at the beginning and what it might look like. This is one of my favorite examples um, because this stock just kind of uh, – it, it gapped up here. There was a little excitement, and but in general, it just kind of worked its way higher. It, it didn't really set the world on fire, but there was something brewing here. And I really didn't have a setup to get in any earlier than I did. But then the stock began to accelerate, and this is when it kind of woke me up. Actually, I'm saying all this. I didn't notice it until this day here, until I made the TKO, okay? But then I go back in time because, you know what, all that's known. And then I said, okay, Dave, what do you see? Well, let's see. It's kind of working its way higher here. There was a gap. wasn't doing a whole lot here, but going mostly sideways. But then it began to wake up. Okay, it went sideways again. No problem. But at least it's making a box on top of a, box, of a box, a la Darvis style, okay? And it's beginning to accelerate, and it's persisting. It tends to go up day after day. I can draw a line through the bars. As uh, Bill McKinney calls that, he calls it a center, a center line trend line. That's a good way of calling it, okay? So I could draw a center line trend line through the trend, or a center line. Uh, mathematically, that's equivalent to linear regression. You could plot a linear regression line if you want. And then I've got... A TKO pattern. So all of this is known. I know everything in the world. But I'm going to obsess, and I'm going to make sure I've got the best trade in the world. Now, as soon as I enter, enter that trade, I sound like, uh, what's her name? Medea? <laughs> enter. As soon as I enter that trade, I have to accept what happens. I'm stepping into the unknowns. So I have to go from obsessing to accepting. The moment I enter that trade, okay, tomorrow, I get into, let's say I get into it today, or well, I guess I get into it tomorrow because I'm looking at it at night. Next day, I get into it. So I get into it 
tomorrow. And then on Monday, the CEO decides that he's going to molest his secretary. And the company loses a trillion dollars overnight or whatever it was. You probably know the story by now. All because this idiot, i got to watch what I say next. But you kind of get the idea. And we're going to talk about that in one second. All it takes is one a-hole to screw up your trade. That's uh, Mark Douglas is where I got that from. And Mark's right, okay? You have no control what happens next. You had a be You have a beautiful setup. You did your homework. You obsessed. Now you have to move into accepting what will happen, okay? And that control thing is hard. We all are successful here in our current or prior careers. And how did you become successful? You control the situation. Okay, you use control to repair that transmission. You use control to make the right decisions in your business investments. You use control to, when things weren't going your way, as they won't on occasion if you're alive, you use control to remedy or certainly mitigate the losses in that situation. Without control, you would not be where you are. You would not be who you are, okay? But in markets, you have no control. So you have to go from that obsessing into the accepting, okay? So now we're into the middle of the trade. There's really not that much to do. But you're successful, so you want to take some action. But there's nothing to do. If your stop isn't neared, sit on your hands. And the reason I use the word neared is because if you are a little bit more experienced and the market just comes down and kind of gives you stop, gives your stop a little kiss and then begins to take off again, then you might want to stay with the trade. Now, that's an extra decision. That brings on some psychological problems, okay, potential psychological problems. But if you're disciplined, by all means, stay with the trade. So as long as your stop isn't neared, you don't have to take any action. I, again, I use the word neared too because that means that some action is going to have to be taken. Now, you might have a hard stop in place if you're not very disciplined, and that's fine. Okay? My point is that you could make a lot more money longer term if you are disciplined and can apply a little bit of discretion. But that's okay to have a hard stop in place. But if you stop, as long as your stop isn't neared, there's nothing to do. You sit on your hands. Now, if the profit target isn't neared, you sit on your hands, too. And the reason I say that is neared is because let's say your profit target is here and the stock rallies up. And it's just almost to that profit target, but not, not quite. And this is this much, okay? That's your profit target. And this up here is some multiple of that maybe 10 times maybe 100 times that okay that's what you hope to make on the trade and this is what you have so far okay so in the big picture scheme of things this is this is what you're looking for initially and then this is what you're looking for hopefully longer term there's a word hope again okay So if it's neared, it doesn't quite get there. It's okay to lock in a little early because in the big scheme of things, you're doing this. Now, I'm not saying if you're looking for 1000 bucks and you lock in 900 or 950 or something like that, that's probably close enough for government work. And I don't want to get into it too much, but if a stock runs up over two or three days, it almost gets there. That's when you need to make that, that decision about maybe getting out a little bit early because it happened so fast. So the point is, as long as your profit target isn't neared, you sit on your hands. But Dave, what if it's going sideways? Read my lips. Sit on your hands. As soon as I finish this webinar, I'll check my emails. Guess what? I'm probably going to have an email. I'll get two or three a day sometimes. Dave, what if you get into stock and it goes sideways? Well, if your stop isn't hit, there's nothing to do. If your stop isn't hit, you must not quit. How's that? Okay. Now, be as close to the market, but no closer. I am guilty as charged. 
I have a position on in a certain Forex pair. I don't know if I should tell you because that'll probably jinx me, but hypothetically, no. <laughs> Let's just say I'm, uh, I'm long the euro and short the dollar. That's there. I said it. Okay. Because it made a little bottom. It looks pretty good. It made a bow tie. And the way my quote screen defaults on Forex is it automatically pops up a five-minute chart when I log in. That's probably my own fault because I set it up like that a long time ago. But be that as may. And if I don't watch myself, this is why I keep myself extremely busy during the day. But it's like funny. Yesterday I got all excited because I saw the, I saw like a pattern on a five-minute chart. And I took it. And then within literally within two minutes I was stopped out. And I actually laughed at myself for making that stupid mistake. It was just a little tiny position, no big deal. Uh, but I thought I'd go in and make a little money on my core position or kind of swing trade around that core position. And, boy, was I uh, – I got my ass handed to me right away. Well, I'm glad I did. But Dave, how can you be glad you lost money? Well, I'm glad I did because that's one more – that's one more uh, – thing to tell me don't bend the rules don't break the rules be as close to the market as you need to be but no closer now if you're a day trader god bless your point little head and I, you know I, I pick on the day traders a lot and if you're successful at it you're good at it and you love it then do it and i get emails from people because i call them crazy ass day traders um but do it if you're if you're successful at it okay but if it's if it's ruining your life or if it makes you crazy all day long, and I know a few that have gone crazy, literally crazy, gone crazy. But if it's ruining your life or, or make it or having a significant impact on your life on a daily basis, okay, then then don't do it. Find a time frame that works for you. Be as close to the market as you need to be, but no closer. I I've told a story before. I called up a trader once. And we were talking about a, a project we might be doing together or something. I don't want to give you too many details. But the moral of the story is, uh, or the, it's like, uh, you know, uh, we're talking and, okay, okay, you'll do this and I'll do this. And what if we did this? And you know, it was going pretty good. I was like, ah! Was like, what the hell? You know, it's like, is your house on fire? What's going on? Ah! You know, it's like it sounded like somebody was 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 uh, had a pair of pliers to his nipples or something. You know, it's like, what the hell's going on over there? And I, I gotta go, I gotta go, I gotta go. Well, you know what, you know what's going on over there? He was, he was trading or day trading, and he's watching every little tick, and it's making him crazy. Okay, don't do that. Be as close to the market as you need to be, but no closer. If you want to be a day trader, then day trade. Okay, and be good at what you do. It's not for me. And I think it's not for most. And a lot of people, so this, the same people that get pissed off at me. When I pick on them for being a day trader or pick up the day traders in general, many of those same people come back three years later and say, Dave, it took me a while, but I get it. And I want to thank you for waking me up to that. I was a little aggravated with you a couple of years ago when you told me that I was stupid for doing this, but now I get it. And again, there's a few select people that can do it. A friend of mine was an ER doctor for 20 something years. I don't know any ER doctor that's lasted that long. And he would probably still be an ER doctor had he not gotten to a, a very bad traffic uh, accident. Somebody just uh, totaled him. It's just crushed his truck with him in it. And he's got some he's got some medical problems now that he lives with. And now he just he runs like these uh, urgent care centers. He's got two or three of these urgent care centers. And that's what he does for a living now, along with some other uh, consulting uh, in medicine, but I think he'd still be in that ER had that not happened because he's wired to take that stress to make those decisions and he actually thrived on it and lived on it. So if that's what day trading does for you, then do it. But just remember that that will take its toll on your body, even if you are one of these special individuals. Okay. So be as close to the market as you have to be, but no closer. Let stops take you out. Okay. And alarms or alarms watch the market for you. Let's say you come in, you got a setup. It could be my setup, your setup, whatever. Okay, you could get in at 12. Market opens about 11.50, bounces around a little bit. We'll put in a buy stop at 12 and go for a jog. Go for a well, walk. I can't go for a jog. I'm too big, but I go for a walk. Do what you, you know, do whatever you want. Go spend some time with some loved ones or go make some money in your other business. 
But don't sit there and watch it all day. Don't sit there and say, oh, I'm going to get in on a five-minute charge. Get in early. I get those emails all the time, too. Somebody a couple days ago. Dave, what if what if I got in on a five-minute chart? Wouldn't that be great? No, no. Follow the plan. Keep the bigger picture in mind. Be as close to the market as you need to be, but no closer. Okay? And then, of course, give up control. And again, just one a-hole could screw up a perfectly good trade. Okay? Now, the obsessing has to end as soon as you get into the trade. Obsessing must end. Accepting must begin. Checking your portfolio 10 times or 1,000 times a day won't help performance. A while back, and I no longer have that feed, um, but I had a feed once, and I tied it into a spreadsheet. And it, 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 it had some merit because it was working with the fund. There were certain things we had to do years ago, and that was important. And I tied it to my own portfolio, and that had a bit of a disastrous uh, uh, thing for me. Now, truth be told, I still plug in the numbers once or twice a day. I, I, I can't not do that, okay? Can't not do that? Is that a double negative? I mean, it's just I, I do have some of these things. I like to look at it, okay? I'm sorry. But I will plug in those numbers once or twice a day to see what's going on. But I used to have it tied directly into a spreadsheet, and I think I still can do that. I noticed it's a little pop-up in my uh, in my spreadsheet now that says that looks like if I clicked on that, I could tie it in with, live, with a live feed. I don't want to do that. OK, I mean, it'd be convenient at the end of the day so I wouldn't have to punch the numbers in. But if you watch it every little tick, oh, I'm up 100. Oh, I'm up 1,000. Oh, I'm up 10,000. Oh, I'm down 10,000. Oh, I'm down. Up, you know, that's too many emotional cycles once again. So you don't need to check your portfolio 10 times or 1,000 times a day. Sometimes you must lose to win. We'll talk about that once we get to a chart here in one second. Um if a trade isn't working, don't try to stop the bleeding, okay? If you're not stopped out, of course. And that's just human nature. Oh, I'm beginning to lose money. Well, I've been in the stock for five days or five months, and I'm still underwater. I don't want to lose any more money. This trade is obviously not working. I'm going to get out. Well, that's fine if your plan is to stay in so long. I read once about someone who took these little day trades and he said they should work within three minutes and he had an egg timer and every time he get into the trade, he set an egg timer. I mean, God, I don't want to live my life on an egg timer. But that works for him and that's what he does, okay? That's fine. So he gets out with it. If it's not working within three minutes, and God, what a crazy time frame. That, uh, that'll kill you, okay? But that works for him. So if it's not, if it doesn't trigger, I'm sorry, if it doesn't uh, work within three minutes, he gets out. So if that's your methodology and that's your system, then follow your system. But if you're getting into trend trading and your plan is to stick with the trend, okay, and if the stop isn't hit, you're not going to quit, then don't quit. But it's human nature to try to stop the pain. But a lot of, a lot of times I'll see people get out early. I see this over and over and over again. They just feel like, well, it's not working, should work it. Dave, Dave, the market went up and this position didn't go up. I'm out. Well, the market doesn't always move in your time frame. And that's kind of hard to get your head around that. You used to you used to be you're successful, so you're used to doing something and seeing some kind of results right away, positive or negative results, okay? And if they're negative, eh, you move on, you do something else. Well, in trading, sometimes you might just have to wait a little bit for that trend to develop. And the other thing is open profits can't be monetized. Let's hop into a chart and take a look at that again. I've, I've talked about this quite a bit. But a lot of times, and, and, and this is, this is, these are good problems to have. But surprisingly, hanging on to open profits sometimes is harder for people than hanging on to losers. In fact, I think that's actually been proven. That's why I'm I'm brushing up on some of this stuff and some of this behavioral finance stuff. And I've been reading up a lot about it just to kind of wrap my head around how other people's brains might work or how the brain in general works. And that seems to be a problem. People seem to want to lock in that gain because they monetize it. I could buy a car with this. I can pay off this year's tuition for my daughter. Okay. Or I can go buy a classic car or whatever, a boat or something. And you monetize that 
profit, that open profit, okay? Hey, I could buy a nice car with that. And then you give up some of that open profit and you go, ah, oh, now I can only buy a crappy car with that, okay? So it's like equating it to this, this something on a monetary basis really can mess with your head. Now, this is a, a this is an example I've beat to death, but it's such a wonderful example. And this is what we showed earlier, that beautiful TKO, that accelerating trend, just everything was just textbook and perfect here. And then I think the stop was a little bit tighter on that initially. I didn't draw it exactly to scale, but it's to scale down over here. But you get the idea. In general, the market goes sideways, the stop stays sideways, the market rallies, the stop goes up. And that's probably pretty close to what the actual trailing stop look like. Now, notice that right here we're up 25%, and then we gave all of that up, and we're only up 4%. Well, we weren't stopped out, so who cares? And then we were up almost 50%, and then we gave most of that up, or oh, I'm sorry, not most of it, some of that up, and we're only up 25%. Well, we did get stopped out. Here we're up 100%, and now we're only up 72%. And then here we're up 200%, and then we got stopped out at 153%. Now, a lot of people look at this loss and think that they lost. It's like they, they focus on the loss of the trade. They don't focus on the fact that they made a lot of money on the trade. They made 153% on a trade. And that was over, how many months was that? I've monetized this before. I mean, I've monetized, uh, annualized this before. One, two, three, four, six, about seven months, okay? So that's round numbers, 250% or more, if I'm doing the math right in my head. It's 250% on a trade. That's a pretty damn good trade, don't you think? But most people can't hold on to here, okay? They're going to quit at some point. Well, Dave, what, what if I quit up here and made 200%? Well, then – you're never going to make 400% on a trade. But Dave, what about maximal, maximum adverse excursion? What is it, maximum favorable excursion? It seems that we never hardly make more than 200% of the trades. We'll take it 200%. Well, so what? This one might be the one that goes up 10,000%. Probably won't be, okay? But if you quit, you're never going to find out. So just wait until your stop is set. Be patient, too. This is what I call a fantastic trade. This is why I use this trade as an example all the time. What I love about it is it wasn't perfect once we got in. It was perfect back here, okay? But as soon as you get into trade, and guess what? As soon as you get into any trade, it's no longer going to be perfect, okay? Keep the questions coming. I'll get to them in a second. I appreciate them. Thank you so much. But notice that it went sideways here, went sideways here, went sideways here. And that's so-called dead money. And how many dead money reports have I done? I don't even want to admit it because it's something that I beat the dead horse on. I've talked about it ad nauseum. People aren't patient. People can't wait. Okay. So there's a beginning, there's a middle, and there's an end. And sometimes you have to lose to win. You're up 12% on the first day. You're feeling like a freaking genius. And then you let all that evaporate. Well, now you feel like an idiot. Well, why should you feel like an idiot? You're not stopped out. Just stick with the trade. You're up 25%, then you gave up the line share of that. Well, feel like an idiot again. No, the, it's done nothing wrong. It's just making this consolidation in here. And maybe it's a base before it takes off and goes to space. And lo and behold, in this case, it was. Okay. And then you're up 40-something percent, and, and then you're only up about 25%. Oh, man, I gave up all that. Then you're up 95%. Well, that's pretty good. You had some dead money in here. Well, you had dead money for a long time. In fact, you actually lost a little bit of that open profit, and you were only up 72%. So what? Okay. And then, again, you were up 200%. You got stopped out at 153%. That's much better than the poke in the eye. I remember once I was up 20-something points in an options trade back in the go-go days. And I was on the phone with the trader and I was screaming and cussing and fussing. And he's like, what the hell's going on? I said, like, Oh, they just screwed me. I just got screwed in this order. He goes, well, what happened? I said, I said, I'm pretty sure they screwed me three quarters of a percent. I said, I, I don't know what my, 
you know, recourse is going to be. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I was just angry. He goes, well, what did you make on the trade? I said, well, 27 points. He says, he says, let me get this right. You made 27 points on a trade, and you're pissed off because you didn't make an extra three quarters of a point. It's like this was like an options expiration or something. I was being forced out, and it kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. And that was a that was an important one of many important defining moments. It's like Look at the net net. Look at the end results. Did you make money? Yes. Then quit bitching. I had a little epiphany as I put my slides together. And I think it was uh, George Carlin or somebody once talked about this. <laughs> Taking a trade is like buying a pet. It's going in badly. That's one thing I can guarantee. Okay. It's going to end badly. Something bad is going to happen in the end. You went from 200% and change down to 150%. It ended badly. So what? Okay. You're going to give up in the end. You're going to give up some of that open profit. That's a good problem to have. The other thing could happen is you're going to have a loss. So what? Okay. If you have a loss, not a problem. Be happy. Provided, of course, be happy. How can, gee, how can you be happy if you got a loss? Well, provided, of course, that after you do the postmortem, you can honestly say that you obsessed before the trade. Okay? You planned your trade and you traded that plan. One of the things I'm kind of noodling with, if I do this course, or I should, I keep saying if because it's going to be such a big undertaking, but when, I should say, is that. I'm going to make some exercises. One of the exercises is going to be you follow the exact plan. You plan the trade. You follow the plan. And if you do that, no matter what happens, you have a little small reward for yourself. You go eat a nice restaurant you've been wanting to eat at. You go have a round of golf or whatever you're into. Okay, go get a massage or something or a spa treatment, whatever. Do something good for yourself, something you've been wanting to do. Treat yourself, okay? If you follow the plan, regardless of the outcome, and that's hard for many. And remember, getting through some bad trades is probably something you're going to have to do. And this is another Douglas thing that comes to mind. I have one of his cassette tapes here, Mark Douglas. Read everything by Mark Douglas, by the way. And in one of his cassette tapes, I think it was from a TAG conference. I'm showing my age back in um, New Orleans in, uh, I guess, the mid-90s or early 90s. Uh, there was a technical analysis group, I think, or something, conferences, and then that morphed into, uh, that was CompuTrack did that, and then there was, a, and that became like Traders Expo and Money Show and all that. Uh, anyway, boy, it's it's kind of it's kind of a pinch me moment. I, that's when selling a bragging, but it's, it's exciting to be speaking at, uh, I'm going to be speaking at Traders Expo in October um, for um, one of many times. So that's kind of exciting, again, to actually to attend something like that and then actually be on stage. So anyway, I, my ego just reared its ugly head. Sorry about that. Put a little plug in for those guys. But if you get through the bad trades, all that's left is a good ones. Like Douglas says, he says that you have two salesmen and one salesman makes a half a dozen calls and he gets a bunch of no's, all no's. What does he do? Well, the bad salesman, goes and drinks his lunch okay, and quits for the day. A good salesman gets six bad calls in a row. What does he do? He goes get a big cup of coffee and he says, all right, I got those six crappy calls out the way. By the law of averages, within the next few calls, I'm probably going to have some success. I'm going to make some sales. So the difference in mentality between the two is the difference between an unsuccessful salesman and a successful one. And then one last point I forgot to say earlier is making money ain't so bad, okay? Making money ain't so bad, right? You make 27 points on a trade, eh, you didn't make 27 and three quarters because of an order issue, okay? Or you were up 200%, eh, you, you only had to make it 150%. Only 150%? You know what? If you're ever pissed off because you only made 150%, give that money to me, 
and and that way you could erase that trade from your memory. I'll take that money from you. I will do that for you. I will. I mean, I'm I'm that kind of person. So if you ever make if you're ever up 200% of a trade and you only make 150% and it pisses you off, I will take that troublesome cash off your hands. Mail it to me. My P.O. Box is 298, okay? Address to Cintiv Trading, LLC, or just Dave Landry, I'll get it too. P.O. Box 298, Abita Springs, Louisiana, 70420. I will take, I will take that money off your hands, okay? So making money ain't so bad. Now, a couple of random thoughts. Uh, like Tom McClellan said, would you make a trade? You're not just buying a company and expecting the company to do good things. Well, you're obviously doing that, right? You're expecting that CEO not to not to F around, right? Okay? You're expecting like uh, a company once that I was short, but I bailed out because I got a little anxious like an idiot and missed the – I missed the absolute top by an eighth of a point, and I was short. If I'd have just given up that one eighth of a point, I'd have made a fortune because they ended up cooking their books. So I guess when you're short, it's okay if the company does something bad. But let's say you're buying a company. You're expected a company to do great things and do its best to do great things and do legal things and not do anything illegal. But then all it takes is one a hole to come along and do something stupid. Some some guy at a hedge fund desk, fat finger or something. Uh, somebody comes out with a bad report. Okay, something happens. So all it takes is one person. But more importantly, or as importantly, I should say, you're also forming a relationship with everyone else who's ever bought that stock. And as Tom McClellan says, and those people will screw you. Okay, so that's where you have to give up the 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 trying to figure it all out and having control. And then I, I talked to Tom a while back, and it's, uh, Tom asked me to, to join a, a group that he's in, uh, a, a forum, and I gladly, um, you know, if Tom asked you to do something, you do it, right? And I, and I was excited to do it too. And I said, Tom, i got to tell you, I've been quoting you ever since you said that at that AAPTA meeting back in New Orleans. I've been quoting you over and over. And he says, I'll do you one better. He goes – regarding market timing. He said, his late mother Marion said, everyone uses timing in their investing. Some people buy when they have money, some people sell when they need money, and while others use more sophisticated methods that are more sophisticated, okay? So people are buying and selling, and as I've told the story at Naj about my good friend Dick Fruth over in Houston, he's running a bunch of money over there, and back in the day, as, as he wrote in his book, back in the day, Richard Fruth, look him up on, um, it's a good book, by the way. You didn't read it. Um, Parabolic Moves and Stock Trends or something. But back in the day, people didn't really trust the banks and the brokerages. That's how, how long he's been in the business. The people come in with the shares. And the other brokers would just snatch the shares out of their hands, make the transaction, and then go off and eat lunch and do whatever they wanted to do. Go back to BSing with the other guys. But Dick would sit them down, get him a cup of coffee. And I'm kind of embellishing a little bit. I imagine that's what he would do, just knowing Dick, because he's very uh, gregarious type of guy. And he would say, so why are you selling these stocks? Oh, I'm getting married. Oh, I'll get a divorce. That witch or that, you know, could be the woman coming in too, obviously. Uh, my son's graduating college, and I want to give him a, buy him a new car. Or my son's going to college. I want to pay his way to college. My son got accepted to law school. That's a great thing, but <laughs> – Guess I'm gonna have to give up some of this money in the meantime. Okay, so all these reasons on why they're selling this stuff: buying a house, buying a car, buying whatever, buying a boat. Okay, they have nothing to do with the company. They have nothing to do necessarily with technical analysis. Okay, so I mean, as big a fan I am of technical analysis, you know. It's not a be-all, end-all for everything. Somebody still might get divorced, okay? Somebody still might need a house. Somebody might need the money, okay? Somebody might sell stocks when they need the money. That's shocking. So whatever you think you got it all figured out, you don't. But you can still work in this environment even though you don't have everything figured out. You have a stop in place, and you pick the best stock to begin with.
Okay. Now, before I can fix you, there's a few. There's actually more than just a few. But I started writing them down here. Assumptions. And before you spend any money with me and or waste my time, okay, because <laughs> I've had people that wasted my time for 20 years. And I tell them what to do. They don't do it. Okay. I'm not sure why they're so obstinate. But maybe they shouldn't be trading. Okay. But if you could do all of this, okay, I think you're well on your way. Are you adequately you, – you are adequately capitalized, easier for me to say. You have – Unlimited hopes and dreams. Oh, come on. You know, we all want to be motivated, okay? Listen to a little Shia LaBeouf every morning, get you up and going. What's his name? The uh, the basketball coach. I love listening to him. Bobby Knight, you know. <laughs> Sometimes I'll crank up a little Bobby Knight in the morning. You know, that little speech he uh, gives his, uh, his team. He can be quite motivational, I find. So we all have these hopes and dreams, and we're all motivated, but just be realistic and reasonable, okay? And you might just find yourself pleasantly surprised, and this is longer term, okay? You're not trading with the grocery or written money. You have the support of your spouse or significant other, okay? Bringing trading into something where you don't have support, that's just going to complicate things even further, especially if you're not successful, which, of course, is going to feed on it itself, because you're under that pressure. You're not hiding the activity from others, feeling like you're getting away with something. Uh, you want to be fixed, okay? This is where freshman psychology may rear its ugly head. And the fact that I stayed at the Holiday Inn Express last night, okay? That might apply as far as fixing you. But there are quite a few easy ways to fix people. And nine out of 10 times, I knew I'd go long in psychology. <laughs> Sorry. Not out of 10 times, I'll fix a lot of people by saying, you know, I'm like, what the hell is this guy doing wrong? I've got to figure it out. And, and either I actually download their brokerage records and look through the trades, or the easiest way, the first step I do, and usually nine out of 10 times I find out, it's like, well, what are you doing wrong? Well, I'm not honoring my stops. I'm getting in early. I'm, I'm bailing out as soon as it goes a little sideways. It's like... Okay, number one, honor your stops. Number two, wait for the entry. Don't try to get in early. Number three, tough it out. Just sit with the position, okay? I don't mean tough it out if it keeps going against you, going against you, and blows through your stop. But if, as long as your stop's it's not hit, don't quit. Stop me if you heard that before. You have some experience. You've been through an up cycle, a down cycle, and ideally plenty of chop. I've showed this slide quite often. Market does that. Some guy starts trading with me right around here. Bravo for your system. That's an exact quote. Bravo. Bravo for your system. On the exact day the market topped. And then a couple of months later, market went sideways. You suck. I quit. And guess what happens? The market goes straight up. Okay. So until you live through a couple of cycles... A sharp reversal, some choppy market, a sideways, a sideways and choppy market, okay? You're going to have to live through a few cycles, unfortunately. You're not expecting a paycheck. Every day in my email, I get an email about have the market give you a paycheck. Well, go and read some Jesse Livermore. Read Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. And he talks about the chap who expects a paycheck out of the market. Just go ahead and read him. Not enough time to get into it. In a lot of details but boy does that sell you know if I had no morals I, I, I should come up with a little system or I don't even have to come up with a system because I got a system I got my own trading methodology I'll just say hey quit your day job because you're gonna make a paycheck by trading my system every week every month just go to the mailbox get you a little check out the mail okay if only it were that easy it's not. But longer term, you're going to catch some trends, and you're going to do just fine. Okay? Uh, provided you're not doing this for excitement. And here's a big warning. Trading, if done properly, can be quite boring. But what you could do with the money is exciting. Okay? So... I just said don't think about the money. Don't think about the money when you trade. But after the trade is done, 
if you want to do something good with that money for yourself or for mankind or for your children, then then do it. And that's exciting. OK, the actual process can be a little boring at times. OK, my excitement is like looking at the charts. I, I just have fun because I know that if I do it right, I'm going to make some money on a trade and I'm excited about that money that I'll make. But while I'm in the trade, I try not to get too caught up in the emotions and I try to follow the plan. I use the word try because every now and then, I think it was yesterday, as I just said, admittedly, I'll do something stupid. a fire off a day trade, okay? I'm still human, but I make those mistakes less and less and less. And I know I'm prone to them, so I don't do them as much. You're going to take this seriously. Seriously, if you were an unsuccessful doctor, automatic transmission mechanic, would you just quit after 20 unsuccessful years, okay? These people that keep they email me and whine and whine and whine. Oh, I lost money. I knew I shouldn't take this trade, but took it anyway. You know, it's like <laughs> stop trading. Okay? You obviously don't want to be successful because if you took that long a time, you should be successful by now. Okay? Now, there's a lot more to it, but if you could do all of this and put a big check mark on all that, I think you're well on your way. All right, a uh, quick look at the old portfolios because I said I would do it uh, in the um, in the promo that I sent out. Uh, this is what's going on. If you want to take a look at it, that's it. Uh, these ones that are white is where we have taken profits, and the ones that are yellow are ones where we have open profits. Um, yeah, it's great. We got 9 out of 10 or 10 out of 11 that are profitable, but I'd much rather one of these numbers be, let's say, um, 10,000 or 20,000 or 30,000 as opposed to them all being profitable, okay? Uh, so keep in mind that, yeah, we're, 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 we're hitting up. We've got an incredible batting average right now, but the, the home runs are more important than the batting average. I didn't write that down, okay? And the home runs are, are a lot more important than the, um, than the singles. Okay, a lot of questions coming in. Phil says, you mean you can't get from 5 to 20 without going through 10? Absolutely. How many times have I said that? Okay. CTLT has been a long time. Yes, it has. And you know what? I hope we're talking about that stock two years from now, okay? <laughs> Perhaps the weight loss companies will call you a fraud. I find using a limit order to pay a higher price above previous high for a stock is the most difficult thing to do, but I know that, but I know why we need to do it. Well, no, you don't want to use a limit order, okay? If you're going to enter a stock, you don't want to use a limit order because they're going to fill that order automatically. Read, can I have your order, please, in layman's. If you don't have layman's, you don't have that chapter, I get a lot of questions on entries. I'll just give you the chapter because that'll save you a lot of explaining, okay? You don't want to put in a limit order. Let's say your entry's here. If this market, let's say this market's at 10, your entry's 11. If you put in a limit order at 11, they're automatically going to fill you, and they're going to rip you off. So don't use a limit to entry. What you can do... And I'm not a huge fan of doing this, but sometimes you can do this, is you can put a limit order to take partial profits. So that means that you want, let's say you want 15. We're looking for 15 in the stock. If it trades at 15, you're going to go ahead and take that. You'll, you'll take that, okay? You'll take 15 bucks for half of those shares. So don't use a limit order to, um, to enter a stock, but you can use it to exit, okay? Dave, excellent material. Thank you, James. I appreciate that. I must run to an appointment. Bonjour. Bonjour, James. Bonjour. Looking for a thousand profit, 950 might be close enough. Use discretion. How about buy stop at 12 is 1198 with strength close enough? How about 1190, 11 side of five? Is the difference to opening trade and closing a trade? Yes. Yes. He's saying is there's a difference between opening a trade and closing a trade. Let's say you're going to buy a stock at 12. And it's at 11.98 or 11.75. Where, where's the magic number that you get in if you're going to buy it at 12? The magic number that you're going to get in is at 12. Okay. And last part of your plan was to play like an opening gap reversal to get in a little early. Not enough time to get into that today. Then you don't beat the system. Everybody wants to beat the system, not to beat up, beat you up, Howard. But I get it, and I know where you're coming from. It's like, well, why don't we get in early? No. Okay. We're we're taking profits a little early just to make sure that we get those profits. And it's not on every trade. It's only, like I said, I think it's about once every three months you have to exercise a little discretion. But it's very important that you do. 
it's not that often. So the thing is, let's say this market runs up over three days. Let's say we get in here, okay? This type of move straight up is probably not sustainable. Okay, it's kind of funny. I drew it like a little firework, you know, and this firework goes up like this, you know. So and your, your target is here. You know that it's not going to go up the next three days that much. It might, but you don't know that. So if it's skirting that profit target, it's okay to get in just in case it comes right back in. Okay. So that's where you, you, you don't want to split hairs. And remember, the profit is this much in the general scheme of things. And then your possible reward is this much. This is going to keep the lights on. This is going to keep you in business. This is going to cover some small little losses here and there. Okay, and it's also going to give you that immediate gratification, which is part of the psychology of the money management. As I said, quite often people say, is your money management psychological or statistical? And my answer to that is yes. But this is the real money. This is the real money here. So we're we're not splitting hairs by taking a little bit of a profit. Now, when it comes to get in again, if it rallies up, gets kind of close to the entry and it comes back in, you want to avoid it. For the reason is, it's the same reason we're taking profits a little early. If this market comes up and just kind of skirts that profit target and it comes in, does that. If we took the profits here, at least we locked them in, okay? But if this market comes up and just barely skirts that entry, doesn't actually hit it, it comes down, does the same exact thing, except here it's doing it a profit, here it's doing an entry, you're going to avoid that losing trade. So again, not to beat you up, Howard, because I, I I know you know what you're doing, but it but you make a valid point. You know why not why not get in a little early? Why not try to beat the system? And that's why, because it needs to be part of your trading plan. Now, if part of your trading plan is, and I shouldn't say this, but I'll, I'll say it. Uh, I don't I can't front run my own entries, but I know people out there, and that like if I have an entry at 12, they will put an entry at 11.98 just in case there's a little buying at 12. Well, my experience has been that even if Big Dave says buy this stock at 12, you know, my ego's not that big to where I think I could actually move a market. I don't move a market, okay? And I know I don't. It, if you watch your time in sales, if you're on a service and you look at the entries and you watch your time in sales, you're going to be amazed at how little trading actually happens there. And the reason big is because people are trying to outsmart the system and people are like, well, I don't like that stock or if people are trying to, to, to beat the system as opposed to following it, okay? Okay, uh, boy, I, Chief Orman went a long time today. Let's open it up for um, for individual profits. We monetize also because we were told not to be greedy. No, Karen, you have to be greedy. You have to be greedy, okay? Because you're going to lose enough money on enough trades, okay, to, to, to erase some gains. You're going to make mistakes in trades, OK, the market will not cooperate. The market might have a sharp sell off and you're long. There must be 50 ways to lose your money. So you have to be as greedy as possible. Don't quit at 50 percent. Don't quit at 100 percent. Don't quit at 10,000 percent. You want to make as much money as you can on every trade. OK, any uh, questions on individual issues? Let me just hop into the markets real quick. Okay. Uh, one of the things I pointed out was Greece. Are you kidding me? Well, when you see a setup, you take it. And this is why we took the Greece trade. And it hasn't worked out just yet. So what? We get paid to trade. We get paid to put money in harm's way. This stock was coming off a major low. It had a bit of a, a double, triple bottom here, triple bottom. Kind of three drives to low, not a huge, huge fan of that pattern. I just call it a falling triple bottom. I guess it's the same thing. And then we had a nice little bow tie here. It was a bit, of, it was in a long, long, long downtrend. And now it looked like it was getting his act together. So that's why we took the grease trade. And initially it looked pretty good. And so far it's been a bumpy ride. So what? We're going to stick with it until we're stopped out. Let's take a look at the overall market real quick. I hope I covered everything that I sent out. Well, I, I knew if I opened up that psycho psychology, uh, trading psychology wor a can of worms, I would uh, I would go on and on. It's good stuff, though. I mean, if I say so myself, it's it's very important that you get your head wrapped around all this. I almost said literally. <laughs> 
Jimmy Fallon the other night said somebody's at a gravestone. I literally died. These kids nowadays, everything's literally. I literally, I literally jumped out of my shorts. No, you didn't. Uh, take a look at the piece. Up a little bit today. Not bad. A decent day yesterday. As I've been saying, it seems like every time this market sells off, it comes back. But every time it comes back, it sells off. Okay. So that's what makes for a chop, 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 choppy market. Okay. Um, off its best levels a little today, but eh, let's not get too excited about one day or the other, but certainly a good day yesterday. Not too, too far from all time highs. Let's go ahead and measure that for those keeping score. The P's are within 1% ah, exactly of all time highs. As long as the market remains at or near new highs, you want to err on the side of what? The longer term trend. So let's throw a moving average in here. And this is kind of fascinating. And this is not the moving average I wanted, but uh, let's that's a 50. It's kind of interesting. We dropped below the 50 yesterday. Now we're back above. So that's certainly a good thing. Let's take a look at the 200. And as I've been saying quite a bit, if you just stayed long, as long as you have multiple lows above the 200-day moving average, in other words, daylight, if you, as long as you stayed mostly long, you do quite well. And we've been mostly above the 200-day moving average for quite a long time, ever since uh, the beginning of 2012. We've only had about five days below the 200-day moving average, or daylight, I should say, below the 200-day moving average. So, so far, so good. You know, you gotta. Sometimes you gotta look at the market with a little perspective. So far, it's going up. Can it go up for, forever? No. Okay, it's gonna go down at some point, and it's gonna go sideways at some point. Well. You know it's going to go sideways. It's going sideways forever, okay? Someday, one of these days, this trend's going to end. It's going to end badly. Hey, write that down. It's like buying a pet. It's going to end badly. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at NASDAQ. Uh, NASDAQ, decent day yesterday, up a percent and a quarter. Not much follow through today, but so what? We are just, wait for it, uh, about a half a percent away from all-time highs. Longer-term trend there. Take a look at the moving average. Not bad. Not bad at all. So far, so good. There, let's take a look at our friend, the Rusty. Well, I love the Rusty because it, of what it represents, these smaller cap issues, and I love these smaller cap, uh, more inefficient stocks. Rusty's still chopping along in, tier, in here too, unfortunately. A little bit of a head and shoulders top, but hey, just shy of all-time highs. In fact, less than a half percent away from all-time highs. So you want to err on the side of the longer-term trend, okay? Matt says, psychology talk, very valuable. I gladly give up looking at a few stocks today for a talk that helps my career. Wow. Thank you, Matt. Matt's a professional. Uh, I appreciate that. I really do. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 have a, I have a tear in my eye. Thank you, man. <laughs> sometimes I get beat up and sometimes I get a nice compliment. Wow. I'm, I'm a little full of D-Sky is a rallies through to above 12, then pulls back. Yeah, maybe. Uh, you do have some overhead problems here. This is one I've been watching. Unfortunately, um, this overhead supply has got me bothered a little bit. Oh, I guess before I do that, I just want to show you one or two things in the markets. Uh, retail kind of broke down in here, but came back. But it's sideways like the overall market. Longer term trend, obviously, still up. But shorter term, looking a little dubious until yesterday. So just take things one day at a time. Transports look abysmal. Uh, we are short UAL here uh, within the transports. And you can see bounced a little bit yesterday. This is yesterday's charts. I don't have today's update in here. Uh, but you can see that look like they're still in trouble after breaking down out of their range. Drugs kind of made new highs coming back in a little bit. So they're kind of sideways too. So for the most part, most areas are pretty much sideways. To my surprise, the energies really hadn't taken off in spite of the dollar bottoming out, or I'm sorry, not bottom, oh, not bottoming out, I'm short the dollar, uh, in spite of the dollar headed lower. You can see a little um, leg lower, a little bit of a bounce today. Ooh, I, I better pull up my five-minute chart and, and cash out, right? <laughs> so that's what's going on there. Uh, obviously, if you take a look at, like, the real estate, real estate's been imploding as of late. You can see it drop below its 200-day moving average. It looks like it's in a lot of trouble. Broke it down out of this sideways range, Okay. Wide and loose sideways range. And then take a look at bonds. No big shocker there. Well, bonds have been imploding as of late. A little bit of a bid today, which is good to see. I like to see them get back into this uh, prior little breakdown level so we don't have to worry about them as much. But this looks like the mother of all tops here. 
in bonds. Not enough time to get into the transitional patterns that predict these uh, or help you define these tops today. But just trust me, in bow tie, first thrust, uh, kind of a big picture gatekeeper, it was all there and all all pretty obvious. And if it's not obvious at the time, it's pretty obvious now that that was the top. And so far, they are down trending. All right, Nate. Sorry, you got to run. Ah. <laughs> yeah, we're long UEC, and somebody there's somebody called Nick Hodge out there that's pumping it, saying it should be three fifty dollars, three three dollars and fifty cents, and they're sending out these spam uh, emails named Nick Hodge, and uh, Nate wants to know if my name is Nick Hodge. No, I'm not Nick Hodge. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. Eric's is a great webinar. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's hop into these individual issues. Uh, MTSI. Yeah, that looks good. Uh, but what you need to do is it, you need to wait to see if it cleared this prior little high in here decisively and then look to trace some pullbacks along the way. So, Steve, uh, good uh, good eye on that one, but uh, there's no action that needs to be taken just yet. Karen wants to know about SVA. Uh, it's too thin, Karen. Uh, only 90,000 shares on average. Uh, if it's an IPO, sometimes I'll, I'll dip into those uh, very thin ones like that. But I would be careful with this one just because you can see it's kind of choppy and wide and loose. I hear you, though. It looks like it's bottomed out. It looks like it's got – I know you got a good eye for charts. I, it's, it's got a little bow tie here. Um, but it looks like it would have already triggered. So I would stay away from this. Uh, number one, because it's too thin, a little choppy, and it's also, it's not coming off of major, major lows. Remember earlier I said, is it coming off a of major low? So right there would have been a major, major low in in that particular stock. So that would have been a good time to obviously buy this one, uh, provided, of course, it was a little thicker than, uh, than it is now. So I'd avoid that one. E-H-I-C, E-H-I-C. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Um, my dilemma with IPOs, and sometimes you'll see me go after them, uh, especially like in a trading service, is sometimes you don't get a deep enough uh, retrace on their first really run higher, okay? Notice that right here, it really didn't pull back much. I would have preferred a little bit more pullback. And then right here, it really hasn't pulled back that much. But I'm going to go ahead and say yes, and I think it's worth a shot. Uh, but it's definitely going to be dangerous. Maybe a fairly liberal entry, about 17 and a half, and a fairly liberal stop, like way down here at 13. Because look at the HV. The HV is now 70 on this. So it's become very volatile, very fast. Okay. Shop. SHOP from my buddy Phil over in England. Yeah, I wish I had a better chart, chart on this. Um, yeah, it's made a, uh, let's see. If I, I can't pull it up in Metastock on the fly. Um, so this this mark here is kind of messing me up, my scaling. But let's see what we got. Let's see if I can get it out a little bit more. Um, it, it is that it, you had the I, IPO course, so it did take off. Um, I think I would wait. And my scaling is a little messed up on here. But just kind of eyeballing it and trying to, in my mind's eye, do the scaling properly. Uh, let's see, what's the low on that? The low is 25. and the high. Yeah, it's not enough run from here to here. I know it's kind of hard to see because the scaling's messed up for the pullback. Sometimes you get that run higher, and then you get that first little retrace that out of the IPO without giving away too much of the course here uh, on the fly. Uh, but it looks okay. I hear you. Uh, sometimes that first little breakout could be a good little play too. So maybe if it breaks out above uh, 30 and change, it might be worth a shot. But for me... To get excited about this one, at least at this juncture, it would have to break out past 30, and I look to play that first pullback. But yeah, as a as a breakout play, it's probably not a bad play because you've got a nice little range established on this. Ignore this bad tick back here, or first tick, whatever that is. So it might be worth the play as a breakout play, but only if it can get above 30. A little bit safer, excuse me, a little bit safer play. Now you might get in a little too late though. Would be to wait for a close outside of this range. Okay. It IPO to 17. Yeah, but is that a real number? I mean, there's there's no tr that's that's not a real number necessarily. It says 16 has zero volume. So um, maybe I could pull it up in Metastock uh, after the show and see what it looks like over there. But it hasn't really caught my eye um, even there. Is it the first week breakout? Yeah, but remember, Phil, there's some caveats with that first week breakout. Okay, 
and you have to go in and watch, go in and rewatch the show. And there's some caveats that would make this not a, a actual setup, but good eye. I think, I think you're onto something here. It might be worth a shot. Okay. All right. Any more? I guess I'll wore you guys out with all that psychology talk, huh? <laughs> Do I have to listen to you again? Oh, well. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. That's what I like about you Brits. We can uh, we take the piss out of each other. <laughs> That's okay. He's a, I learned a lesson from a buddy of mine. He said, you got to take the piss out of yourself first before you take it out of everyone else. Heather wants to know about CMT on a pullback. CMT, good to see you, Heather. How are you today? Yeah, sure. Uh, a little bit on the thin side, uh, or a lot of bit on the thin side, but it does kind of trade cleanly, okay? And let's see how new this is. And it's not a new issue. Yeah, this is a little bit more speculative issue because it's a little thin. But, yeah, on a pullback, I see what you're seeing. Uh, look at this persistent trend in here. Just for S and Gs, let's do a linear regression and see what that looks like. Look at that. Oh, see, almost perfect. That center line, trend line, as um, my buddy um, Bill calls them, or draw the line, draw a trend line through the bars, as I call them, or a linear regression, as uh, the mathematicians call them. So, yeah, on a pullback, it's a pretty good-looking stock, though. Good, good eye on that. Good eye on that. A little thin, though. Be careful. You're welcome, Heather. She says, thanks for a great webinar. M-B-L-Y. Uh, no, I'd hold off on this one. It's kind of all over the place. Um, see if you can keep breaking out. Now, with IPOs, you, you do have a, an inclination. There's a lot of people that are tied up here, okay? And when you see that first deep retrace, that often happens. That's one of those patterns we spent a lot of time talking about, if you remember, in the webinar or seminar, I should say, the course. I'm never sure what to call it. I guess it's a course. Webinar sounds cheap and free like this. <laughs> of course, sounds expensive. Um, but it's not expensive. But, yeah, you do have these these deep retraces, and that's because you you got VC back here, venture capitalists. you got people that, are, that, are, uh, that buy it and have lockups. You have people that have lockups that have owned it before it went public. You got the sweat equity people. They're looking to get hold. And – invariably you seem to have these deep retraces in them. And so sometimes in these deep retraces, my point is that you could get rid of some of this overhead supply and there's no way to quantify that. So I don't worry as much about the overhead supply in an IPO. I still worry about it, okay? But not as much as I worry about it, provide, of course, if it's had a deep retrace like this or if it's bottomed out for a few months at lows. Because I know that those people that were inclined to sell it have probably worked their way through the system okay a little bit world's a little bit more complex than it seems at first glance and the other thing too it's just a little bit a uh, few weeks of overhead supply to deal with so so far it's pushing into it but for me to buy it it would have to continue to push higher and then maybe pull back so now you got that first pullback after a base breakout if it looked like that it'd be worth a shot in fact if it did that you'd be through the supply anyway so i guess that whole talk was academic Phil wants to talk about lock. Uh, la, 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 la. Um, it's a little wide and loose. Um, i tell you, though, I listened to a little radio uh, yesterday. And, um, boy, these companies, especially like LifeLock, they're going to they're gonna use all this uh, government breaches and all these uh, uh, stealing of identities. They're going to use that to their advantage. That actually got me thinking, and I hate to confuse the issue with facts, but maybe think about this company a little bit. Uh, maybe on a pullback, okay? It's a little wide and loose, and then now, because it's a more established issue, I think, you know what, I think I'd pass now that I'm looking at this overhead supply. You can see the more time I have to spend on this chart, the more I'm going to obsess, okay? Again, so you want to obsess before you get into it. But maybe if it got past 18, it began to pull back a little bit. I think I'd reevaluate that. Peter says, wondering about TSE on NYSE from Pete. All right, Pete. Hey, Pete, good to see you. TSE. Pete's a subscriber. Um, it didn't pull back enough here. 
for a knockout move, if it came back in a little bit more to a little bit more substantial knockout, that would be a double top knockout. Watch last week's webcast. I mean, great eye, Pete, because notice that it accelerated higher after it worked its way higher. Uh, it had everything working for it, except it just didn't, didn't knock out enough. So now I'm looking at this little crawling higher. I would much rather see this thing have knocked out, maybe not that extreme, about like that, and then snap right back up. So I would avoid it for now. But again, you know, I'm a bit of perfectionist. I like to obsess before I get into a trade and not afterwards. Tommy, if you heard that before. Good words today. Psychology, much, much more important than method. Got to scoot. All right, Rich. Looks like I've, I've, everybody's got to go. <laughs> Thanks for another great webinar. You're welcome. Uh, VDSI, this will be the last one. Chief Woman really wound up today. Uh, no, uh, it's just too, it's too wide and loose. It's going to have to break out past these prior highs to get its act together. Uh, you notice, notice how clean it was back here and how beautiful it was. Okay, when you had see, I've got this pullback outline back here, but uh, now it's too wide and loose. But if it breaks out past those highs, then by all means, you're welcome, Art. Art says thanks for a great show. Well, look, uh, we've gone way long today, so I better wrap things up so the recording gets um, uh, preserved for the archives. Uh, thank you guys and girls so much for showing up today. I appreciate it. I had, a, I, I, especially today, I had a blast doing this. I love talking about trading psychology because it's something that I'm not immune, and it's something that I'll never completely conquer, but I know that I could get better and better at it and do the right thing. Uh, th uh, that little day trade I did yesterday, throw that out. <laughs> anyway, um, everybody have a fantastic weekend. If we don't talk again, any un unanswered questions, easy for me to say. Dave at DaveLandry.com. Thank you guys and girls so much, and I'll see you next week. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome.